Welcome to The Authentic Spiritual Journey, a weekly podcast featuring real and practical spiritual conversations from diverse perspectives here on the Experience of the Soul podcast channel. Today, episode 246, we welcome to the podcast, Reverend Dr. Martha Creek. And now your host, Reverend Cynthia Alice Anderson. Hello and welcome to the Authentic Spiritual Journey. My name is Cynthia Alice Anderson. I'm here today in 818 Studios with my producer. Good morning, everybody. This is Dave Croft. Thank you so much for joining us for episode 246 of the Authentic Spiritual Journey. Ooh. As always, I want to welcome you to a brand new week. I hope and trust that uh, you had a great weekend and uh, we are now officially into March. I'm so happy be done with February and, and off we oh. go. I'm, I'm ready for the time change. I, got, I always get so like worked up when the time changes. I'm like, oh, I don't like it. And then by the time, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm ready for it. Bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not in a hurry to lose February. It's my birthday month. Then. I know. I know. And it was well, a great birthday. And it's also the birthday month of our guest. I have to say, I'm so excited to have a dear longtime friend, a colleague, just uh, all around cool person with us today, Dave. Tell our listeners who our guest the is. The one, the only, the incomparable Martha Creek has joined well, us. Welcome, Martha Creek. <laughs> oh, thank you. You know, if people look carefully, um, Cynthia, Alice, they'll probably think we're cousins because we got a southern accent. So, um, <laughs> exactly. my friends and colleagues for a couple of decades, going on three now, I'd say they they may suspect that we're cousins after they listen a while. We probably are. <laughs> That's what a little scary about this out. <laughs> we probably are, most definitely. Well, it it is a great day, and Martha, it's always great to have you along with us. Um, you know, I was thinking the other day that we met when we were both applying for ministerial school, or or I think you applied just before I did, and I've so enjoyed knowing you over the years and watching your expansive journey and how really you have uh, worked with people, with churches, with organizations, really all around the country in a variety of ways. I mean, we we were talking the other day, and our listeners don't know, but you and I check in regularly, and it was so fun to hear a part of your history I knew nothing about. <laughs> well, including even, I mean, if we look back over that ministerial path, honey, yeah, and how it started, and you know, and this this show, this podcast, and the way you're reaching around the world with this, and, and ex, it could start right there with an authentic spiritual journey, and that how I went out there to, into that ministerial school, believing, <clears throat> I mean, hell bent, hell bent, that that was going to be my path and my way and my journey, and life, God, Creator, intelligence, whatever you want to call it, went, uh, no. <laughs> This is not your journey. This is not mm -hmm. your path. And talk about having to regroup to stand there and say, okay, if this is not what I was hell bent on believing is mine, then what is my uh, authentic spiritual journey? So here we are 20 some years later, having lived yeah. that out. Oh, absolutely true. Uh, but I remember when I heard you speak, you know, I had never met you before and it was just this brief introduction. And I was sitting there thinking I was going to be in the next round, right? Because I just moved to Kansas City and I was going to be taking some ministerial classes, or taking the classes rather, so I could apply. You know, I'd only been in Unity about uh, less than a year and I just, you know, left my entire music career. It was a bit of a jump, you know, but I just was so guided to do it. But anyway, when I heard you speak, I said, my God, if they don't let her in, they're crazy. She is amazing. <laughs> and I said, if she doesn't get in, I'll I'll never get in. That was my thought. Well, is that the first time you've ever been wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> well, you can you can chalk that up one in case your listeners need to know that you made one mistake. Um, <laughs> Just that, the one. That, at least this, one. That this was that that she was going to get into that particular ministerial school, which she did not, and it's pure grace, you know. And if we're looking at what mm -hmm. is true, what is reality based, and what we believe, we think we know, and the trouble with that, then we can all start right there again. Oh, absolutely, and and it's just interesting that that was our first meeting, and yet in my ministry 
you know, over the years, a key supporter and leader of boards of leadership is you. And so your job was actually more expansive than serving only in a ministry. And so it's like you say, this is the authentic journey from the ego standpoint that didn't feel good to not get in, but from spirit, you know, looking at that from that higher perspective, it's like, well, there must be something else. There well, must that be. was absolutely the truth. And, uh, you know, I've given thanks many, many times for that because I don't think that I had enough self, enough authentic, developed, matured self back then that if it had been offered to me, <clears throat> I likely would have taken it because I would yeah. have, I, mm, I didn't have enough differentiation of self to know that even though it was an internal no for me, like the minute that plane sat down in Kansas City, Missouri, it was the strongest, clearest no I've ever had. Wow. And I went right on through the motions, everything. I wanted to understand the process. I wanted I wanted to understand their functionality, you know, and what happened. And it was a clear, clear no even before I got in there. And it's even the irony now as I listen here with you, Cynthia Alice, that you got in having only been in unity a year. Um, that's about how long I'd been in unity. I'd started in religious science and already had a m practitioner and ministerial license there. And part of the letter, they, they give a letter saying why you've not been admitted or accepted or whatever it was. It's called a redirect. A redirection Redire letter. <laughs> redirect. And it was it included because I hadn't been in unity long enough. <laughs> Well, so, that's what everybody yeah. told me that that I would never get in because of that. And mm -hmm. what was so funny is everybody that told me that did not get in. <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. Yeah, it, it so, makes no sense how what happens there. Well, I mean, there's such a powerful lesson in this. I mean, many, including over years, I remember a young a young a young man. I was so struck by his wisdom. And we were kind of working through something and he went, oh, it looks to me like Reverend Martha, you're trying to make sense out of something that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and I remember that just struck me like from my head to my toe, like that's exactly what I'm trying to do. And it's nothing but hell. You know, it's like a pit of suffering to try to make try sense to out of things that don't make any sense. And and we go that we go wild egoically, as you refer, you use the word you know, the term yeah, there, yeah. um, egoically, it goes wild making up stuff, then believing what it makes up and then yeah. building a story out of what it made up and then correlating everything it made up to some other event, dredging the past, projecting it into a future. And yeah. then hi-ho, hi-ho, back to hell we go. <laughs> Instead of, wait, I got to circuit break this baby somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, I, I w it's funny you're saying this because um, my my part of my lifelong journey really has been trying to make sense of crazy. When you grow up in a in a um, dysfunctional household, which is everybody I know, <laughs> let's just be real. And I think uh, part of why I went down studying a lot of psychology and and you know working the therapeutic path is. I was trying to make sense out of crazy and I worked real hard for a long time thinking if I could have just done something different, that this wouldn't have happened, that wouldn't have happened. And finally, I had this very wise therapist who had a lot of, uh, you know, what I would call just common sense wisdom. And she finally said, you know, you just can't make sense out of crazy. That That was her exact words. And I said, Oh my God, you're right. <laughs> you know, it's like, I keep trying to figure them out. This is such wasted energy. And really the energy needs to be on me and my journey and what's next. And what is God trying to do in me? And, and, and what lesson, not, not trying to figure everybody else out, but what lesson is in this for me and how do I move forward from here? Because well, now yeah. that's enough right there to get everybody to stop listening. <laughs> uh, because when most of us hear, oh, I've got some responsibility in this, <laughs> yeah. you know, instead of trying to understand crazy or to get my family to be different than they were, it's like, oh, all, the, the, all my power, all the power in the universe resides in how I'm going to relate to this. 
and what I'm going to do with what I grew up with and what I do with what mm-hmm. happened in the household. And it, it's, it's, it's not for everybody to, you know, to take that level of responsibility to say all the power lies within me for me to change my thinking and my mind about this and for me to get some kind of spiritual grounded and groundedness and, uh, and a different underpinning under this. And mm-hmm. even to hear something like you say, like, all households have a level of dysfunction. All households have that. And that we, if we're not careful though, we enter that like it's a competition. You know, oh, like we're going gonna, gonna <laughs> to one up everybody that's around. So, you know, right, no, right. You, you ain't seen misery till you've heard my tale instead of let me relate, let me mm-hmm. relate to what the human condition has bared in their households. Yeah. And if we're going to compare it, then, you won't hear much from people like you and me about what went on in ours when we step back and gain a perspective and see what went on and not to diminish or or invalidate the feelings right. we had about it either. No, that's that's very true. Well, in the last, say, 10 years, I have really come to a r- real different place about all of that. And, you know, I know on some level, I mean, I don't know how deep I want to go with this, but on. I'm just feeling this on some level, there was some soul agreement for the experience I had this lifetime. And part of that agreement is how those experiences shape me to be able to help and support so many others. And when I think of what this podcast is doing around the world, I know that that is not wasted. So I, I do have, a much more expansive understanding of that than I did say 20 or even 30 years ago, most definitely it, it, you know, age has brought some understanding and also the, the spiritual works, a little bit of illumination about, well, I am really not a victim to life. There's some soul agreement. And uh, in some cases I was uh, not overtly responsible, but covertly as I aged, but, because I did not have an awareness of, of certain things. So I I can see now looking back my soul journey, my development, my lack of awareness, uh, definitely had impact in, in what happened. And that's not to blame myself. That's to say, we're all souls on a journey and there, there are parts I played, but now as I've developed, And I don't think I told you about doing this. This is several years ago. I was looking through a whole bunch of old pictures of my life. And I was really guided to just make kind of a collage. And I I ended up finding one of those big frames that holds like 20 some pictures. And I put a variety of pictures from when I was about uh, two to probably till I was about 40 or whatever in this frame. And what was so interesting as I did that, I said, look at all these great things in my life. Look at, wow, it it was like, yes, bad things happened, but it's gotten so far in the, it's like way in the, in the distant mirror, you know, it's like way back there. I remember it's there, but it's not impacting the way all these incredible experiences are at this point. I, you know, when I went diving in Honduras, when I went to this incredible retreat in Colorado, when I was climbing this thing in uh, Georgia, it was like, oh, wow, I love my life. It, it was like such a renewed perspective. <clears throat> and now that collage, by the way, is in my bedroom and it's the first thing I see every morning. Yeah. Yeah. Well, bravo to you. You know, there's such genius in referencing the past from a higher perspective yeah. and not to be blinded by those traumatic, painful times that we're absolutely then blinded to the the joy, the grace, the mercy, the, mm-hmm. and, you know, even as I hear you refer to our, our soul's contracts or our soul's agreements or anything, you know, regardless of what the listener wants to do with that, we can, it can be summed up as what this was all on purpose. And there's so much said and written about purpose, purpose. I need a purpose. Why not? It's like, well, you've got one. You know, <laughs> yeah, you've whatever. Had one for- you don't yeah. have to look for one. 
You know, it's right in the front of our face. And the and the pain had purpose also once you shift your mind yes. to this, that that you've taken that. And I remember in this um, 10-day Hoffman Institute process I did. Oh, I know about Hoffman, yes. We, we stood up, you know, and gave some insights that we had gained while we were there. And <laughs> one of my closing remarks was, well, it's clear I've got to take the SHI and make some manure out of it. <laughs> so even that has purpose. Yes. And that I was the last to know just how much purpose that has, that uh, that's all to be used in my own development. That is to be used in my own s- salvation, my spiritual awakening, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. And that shifts everything, though, from that's such a problem that's so awful, 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 and then spending the rest of my life awfulizing it. Yeah. Versus saying, I've got to, I've got to look at this and get a different framework around this. And yes, painful. Yes, unpleasant. Yes, indeed. And yes, it had great purpose. And that integration is, I think it's what I call what you're referring to as you say, you look back on it and that when you look back on it with some integration, it mm. doesn't carry the same kind of weightiness. It doesn't carry the same torture. Um, until, mm. uh, until it does uh, like it does until we get it integrated. That is the exact right word, the integration, because, and, and I think in unity, which, you know, I was ordained, as we said many years ago, what I see people doing also is either living in that past, you know, over and over or ignoring the past and everything is the isness of the allness of the oneness. And, they're dying on the inside. And so they're they're what's been so important for me in my ministry, which is why this is called authentic spiritual journey, not the the perfect looking spiritual journey, <laughs> is is that uh there is an integration of this knowing God is everywhere present, God is present in me, and how uh how am I to live that goodness, that grandness in the world? you know, given this, this other truth. And so that is the process. I think it's integrating what we know to be true spiritually. And also, you know, it's like a reviewing of the past with that renewed perspective, but not just pretending it doesn't exist. I mean, sometimes there is therapeutic work to do. Sometimes there is a a new physical practice to do. Sometimes there's, you know, breath work. Sometimes there's just grief work, crying it out. I did not get a childhood or I didn't get my teenage years because I was, you know, caring for my sick parent or or whatever that is. That has to be grief so the new can come forward. And I, I think that is really the work. That is it. The, the work of integrating what we know spiritually. And then as we start, you know, like uh, bringing that into these life experiences, some brand new awareness appears that's grander than, you know, when any, any church quote unquote teaches, it's a, it's a true God experience when we can integrate at that level. Well, and that there's been no absence of God through it all, exactly. you know, it's our own naivete and our simple binary system of filing that was formed from a three-year-old's mind that says, when I get what I want, God's present in it. And when yeah. I don't get what I want, where was God in that? Right. And it's like until that's opened up some to say, wait a minute, that's 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 a three year old's interpretation of where God is present or where God is not, aka when I get what I want. And then when I don't get what I want, then I'm gonna be traumatized by it, or I'm gonna have a tantrum for the rest of my life over mm-hmm. not getting what I wanted, versus accepting growing up and having some clear understanding of there'll be times I get what I want and there'll be times I don't get what I want. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can't even listen to music anymore. You know, once you make a a devoted commitment to, to apply this, to live this out. So then just as I was saying that, that song about unanswered prayers, you know, came to my mind, like that God's presence is in unanswered prayers just mm-hmm. like God's presence is in answered prayers because God knows what we would pray for without ever thinking about 
whether that's that's true or not, whether that's what I actually need and mm-hmm. praying from a place of what I think I need and what I think I want instead of what do I actually need and want. Mm-hmm. So it's a it's the deepest of surrenders and it can it's it can be very, very scary until it's <laughs> very scary. until it's freeing <clears throat> until <clears throat> it's less frightening it's often very very <clears throat> very scary well you're right and you know honestly over my journey working with people i've you know mentored with several people who work very deeply in the spiritual realms and honestly my idea of god has been blown so many times that it's uh it it's been scary in the moment but what i know is as i sit with it and move through it that I, I then can integrate all I have known as well. So in that, that is exactly the work as you're, as you're describing it. And that actually reminds me that uh, we, we spoke about this the other day and it's, it's been on my heart lately with uh, things I've been drawn to read and music I've been drawn to listen to is, you know, my journey has almost come full circle in terms of my connection with Jesus, in terms of my the way I think about my spirituality. And I wondered what's been up for you in your journey about about that. Because you spoke about surrender and it was a real surrender piece for me on this on this journey I'm on. Well it's it's I would describe it similarly as a full circle. I watched a, a Netflix um, series called Voices of Fire, and it's about a choir that was developed over in Hampton Roads, Virginia. Pharrell R- Williams produced it, and it's it's six little episodes of that, and I felt like I had a conversion watching that. Now, I don't know a key from a chord from a note <laughs> musically, literally. Yeah, like, I, yeah. I don't, I don't, I have no clue about that. But this was developing a gospel choir. So 3,000 people came in there to audition, and they sang things like, Jesus Loves Me, The Great Redeemer, and these songs that meant the world to me as a child. And things that I got through scripture from reading, from um, things my little Sunday school teacher used to give me assignments to memorize every week. And I love doing that. And I had cellular shift from that. And this yeah. has returned me to the roots of that. Mm. And it's a new relationship with what I had moved away from and not out of a casting it out. It wasn't out of this ain't for me oh, no, no. or anything like that. It's just having run in a different arena, uh, being in a different arena now. And it's like that root system, though, was growing in me all this time. And it's a return to that, even to speak in terms of Jesus and what would Mm -hmm. Jesus do and Jesus as a master teacher and what would Jesus do in a situation like this and other things. But that old gospel music is alive in my cells and is alive in my bones and blood. And it returned me to there like I had my own revival. Um, It sounds dramatic. And that's as clear as I can put it. Oh, I think that's uh, that's beautiful and uh, uh, not dissimilar to to my experience as well. I love that. I love the way you said the word revival. Uh, that's uh, that's an important word, and I think because it brings energy, vitality into the spiritual journey. And I would say the same was for me. My my experience with Jesus you know, was from the Methodist church. It was from the Baptist church. And even though I've spoken about, I always had this Native American, you know, grandmother giving me these, you know, Native truths and and teaching me these things. Of course, the predominant culture I grew up in was a Christian culture and the Christian school and learning about John Calvin and uh, uh, all, all of those, all of those uh, early leaders. And so as my journey developed, I felt like I always was connected to Jesus, but in a different way. And it was about maybe five or six years ago, I was at a retreat in Arizona, and it was with um, Richard Rohr. And 
I I am not somebody who's followed Richard Rohr, but people have really like loved him. And so I was trying to see what the big deal was with Richard Rohr. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to go on this retreat. I get days to do it and I really need a break and a retreat. And it what the learning was not actually from Richard Rohr. He says what unity has taught for over a hundred years, but because he's doing it from a Catholic perspective, it's like mind blowing to the Catholics. <laughs> But what I did get from that time there is we were talking about Jesus one day and it was, there was an image of Jesus on the cross, which as you know, is a typically Catholic image. And I've heard a lot of people in New Thought and Unity say, Oh God, you know, I don't want to see Jesus on the plus sign. And, you know, they really minimized it and stuff. And I don't want to see blood and guts and I don't want to, you know, I've heard that a lot. And I was, it always felt a little strange to me. I didn't really know how to respond, so just let it go. So at this retreat with Richard Rohr, we were talking about that Jesus image, and I was looking at it, and I I was talking to people at the table, and there was a woman sitting there knitting that was in the, you know how there's there's always one of those at a retreat. And she would say the most deep things sitting there doing that knitting. and. And I said, well, what do you think? I said, I know you've come a long way in your journey. What do you think about this image? And she said something really simple, like, you know, I think it means he suffers with us. And I just started crying right there. I I said, oh, my God, that is exact. Yes. And I got this view back through my entire life of every hardship. Like he was there, he was there, he was there, he was there. So I, I, it it completely transformed any, any, um, discomfort that I felt like new thought was trying to give me with my Jesus. (laughs) And I, and I finally started coming back out of that. And, and now, uh, it's like a love affair I have with Jesus. It's also very personal and private. I don't like talk to really anybody about it. I mean, this is I, I guess I'm coming out of the Jesus closet right now. <laughs> but I but my daily relationship is about that. Some of the music I listen to, I have this, you know, this incredible sense of awe and worship at the same time trying to embody that Christ. He, that's what he called us to, hundred percent. But, but I, I now, anytime I see a Jesus image, I'm thinking about what must have the artist been going through when they painted that Jesus on the cross, or what, you know. So yeah, my my Jesus relationship has come full circle, but definitely much more expansive than it was before too. A much greater understanding. Well, it's out of the closet now through this <laughs> podcast, and I can tell you that. I refer to it as Jesus as my boyfriend. So <laughs> we're both out of the Jesus closet. And all, the only pictures I had in my office for years was pictures of Jesus. Mm. And uh, I, and even and with the irony of it, like how this deep relationship that I've had with um, this leader, mm. um, this way shower, this brother, this um, Christed being, and how little I would talk about it. So keeping it in the closet is is an accurate dis- description of it. And it never took it away from my experience. And um, now, and then Richard Rohr, now I've teased now that I've got a threesome going with Richard Rohr <laughs> and Jesus. And it's because of how I've been able to use these teachings and the writings through Richard Rohr, specifically that universal, that universal Christ and the then idea the of universal breathing, Christ. breathing yeah. underwater, if you want to get practical about it from what an addictive mind and addictive thinking can do, that, that writing of, of, of breathing underwater has been like lifelines to this. Oh, it, yeah, that's an amazing that, book. That mm-hmm. little Netflix series I referred to, this kid got up to sing and she sang Jesus Love Me and she could not sing without bawling her eyes out. And that is what it's about to me. It's one thing to sing a lyric. It's another thing to feel a lyric. And it's another thing to have a relationship with the message, which is Jesus loves me. Yes, he does. How I know 
The Bible told me so. The Bible tells me so. So it's one thing to say it and sing it, and it's another thing entirely to integrate and embody that. And that could be the simpler it gets, the better it gets. Yes, yes, yes. I totally agree. I totally agree. Well, and as usual, this has been spiritually feeding for me every time I I talk to you. And I I hope our listeners, I, I'm sure they are, are applying this to their own journey and thinking, wow, where am I, you know, with all this in my journey? And I think a key to any of what we're talking about is time to explore the spiritual journey. We can't be plugged in every second of the day and do deep spiritual work. You know, we can't be overscheduled every second of the day and do our spiritual work. We've got to set time aside to, uh, as the scriptures say, go apart for a while. You got to get some time to dedicate. Well, I want to encourage that too, of course. I also want to encourage an application of this with our eyes wide open, like listen to songs, listen to lyrics, exactly. real lyrics, mm-hmm. listen to what you're reading. Don't just plow through a book and throw it on a shelf. Like here's another book I've read, like have a relationship yeah. with the teachings. You know, I opened one to read yesterday mm-hmm. from Pema Chodron and the first, the first chapter in it, welcoming um, the unwelcomed. How oh yes, the unwelcomed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the first chapter's oh, name of the chapter is "Start with a Broken Heart." Begin with a broken heart, and it's like, well, that's enough to cl- slam the book closed and sling it out the window, <laughs> or use an <laughs> yeah. image like Jesus on the cross to say, "There's suffering included here," and I've I've been uh, uh, trying to sweep it under the rug or dance around it or avoid it, and it's not effective. So I've got to do something a bit more grown up now. Yeah. I, well, and I often say this show is for the, or my ministry is for the spiritual big kids because we, we've uh, danced around it long enough and know the only healing is to be right in it. And yeah, you can be in the middle of your work day and do integrative work. You don't have to go on a retreat for three months. You, or sit and chant the Om and go to yoga you can be in your business suit in the office, being mindful about what it is you're doing, having a couple of uh, deep breaths between phone calls, uh, working with an image, having a touchstone, you know, that you work with to bring you back to center. There are myriad ways to to work this this spiritual uh, this spiritual awareness. I guess as you go throughout your day. I know you and I are quite busy people, and I don't always have three hours a day to do it. I get up extra early to do my spiritual work, and it extends through the day. So well, that's the it's key, important. I think, honey. Yeah, is to <clears throat> meditate with our eyes wide open. Absolutely. And med- then close them when you get a chance. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and don't wait for that chance to close your eyes to meditate, by all means. And that could be a fun show, mm-hmm. one to do about these best practices, you know, and things like even with our families, you know, waiting for a question before we come in with our opinions and advice and talk about simplifying our own lives, like not to say a single word today until somebody asks me a question. Yeah, let's do that on our next show. Let's do our next time we have you on best practice, spiritual best practices. I think that'd be a great show. Yeah, well, it may not be popular, but it'll be good for us. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. All right, dear friend. Well, as always, it's a blessing to have you on. I know you've got a lot going on right now. You're also doing a lot of speaking and and coaching. You're working with boards virtually. I know you're not traveling right now. Anything you want to tell our listeners about coming up that's happening for you or how to find you? I know your website's... Yeah, MarthaCreek.com. And my email's there, the number's there, the list of things that I've got going on are there. It's, It's a varied approach to what I'm doing. I record anything I can to put it out in the world. I live a mission to serve those who serve and to get empowered teachings to the whole of the planet, which is why I'm here today and to uplift anything that you're about, honey. So they can contact me directly right through that website and get a list of anything that's going on. That is awesome. Well, I'm glad you're staying home. It's so much more grounding uh, than doing all the travel and 
I know family is important to you and you're around some family and being able to do that. So I love that that's your life now and you're still super supportive of so many people, ministers, you know, and organizations. So that is great. Well, thank you so much for being with us. And and to our listeners, thank you always for having us along uh, your journey. And we're always honored to share the day with you in a little time. And again, listeners, if there's something we can do to support you better, please reach out, send an email. We uh, love feedback. We're open to feedback. And we also love to know, is there some big way we have made a difference in your life and world? We'd love to know because we then we'll do that more. <laughs> So, so let us know how you're doing. And as always, thank you for your support. We did meet our $9,000 in 90 days goal. So that is amazing. I can't thank you enough for your financial support and your love. So thanks again for listening, dear friend, and blessings on the journey. We'll see you next week. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Authentic Spiritual Journey here on the Experience of the Soul podcast channel. This channel is made possible because of listeners just like you. If you would like to support the channel with your tax-deductible contribution on an ongoing basis or through a one-time gift, head over to experienceofthesoul.com slash support. The Authentic Spiritual Journey is copyright 2023, Cynthia Alice Anderson, all rights reserved. Our theme music is composed by Dave Croft and used with permission from RR Hot Publishing. The Experience of the Soul podcast channel is a production of 818 Studios. 